for joining us for this, the fourth of the Humane Society University webinars, exploring areas of the human-animal bond. A word for those who may not be using, may not have used GoToWebinar before. Everyone except our presenter has been muted to ensure a clear presentation without background noise or other distractions. There is a chat box which you'll find on the lower right hand of your screen. We invite you to type in any questions you'd like to ask our presenter at the conclusion of his talk. I'll be forwarding the questions to him, and he'll answer as many as possible in the time frame of the webinar. If you have any technical issues, please let us know again through the chat box, and we'll do our best to walk you through fixing them. Today's webinar, given by Dr. Michael Greger, will look at pandemics. Although the influenza virus has existed for millions of years, as an innocuous intestinal virus of wild ducks, its mutations in the last decades have taken it to the brink of becoming a worldwide human tragedy. What turned a harmless waterborne duck virus into a killer? And how have we as humans affected its evolution? Dr. Greger will trace the human role in the evolution of this virus and offer suggestions on what we as a society can do to reduce the likelihood of such potential catastrophes in the future. Dr. Michael Greger is a graduate of Cornell University School of Agriculture and the Tufts University School of Medicine. He serves as Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States. He's an internationally recognized lecturer and has presented at the Conference on World Affairs, National Institutes of Health, and the Institute of Medicine. He has testified before Congress and was an expert witness in defense of Oprah Winfrey at the infamous meat defamation trial. His recent pu scientific publications in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, Biosecurity and Terror Bioterrorism, Critical Reviews in Microbiology, Family and Community Health, and the International Journal of Food Safety, Nutrition, and Public Health explore the public health implications of industrialized animal agriculture. Dr. Greger's latest book, The Acclaimed Bird Flu, A Virus of Our Own Hatching, is now available full text at no cost at www.birdflubook.org. I'm honored to turn over the presentation to Dr. Michael Greger. Dr. Greger, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. My role at the Humane Society of the United States is to study the public health implications that arise from the human-animal interface, of which influenza is a great example. According to the Director General of the World Health Organization, the three greatest threats facing humanity may be the global food crisis, climate change, and pandemic influenza. The flu pandemic of 2009 likely infected about 60 million Americans, but only killed about 10,000 people here. In a world in which millions continue to die of diseases like AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, why was there so much concern about the so-called swine flu? Well, because apparently the last time a nearly entirely new flu virus jumped species and caused a pandemic, it went on to become the deadliest plague in human history, the influenza pandemic of 1918. Most flu strains tend to spare young, healthy adults, but the 1918 virus killed people in the prime of life. More than a quarter of all Americans fell ill. This is a chart of percent of population dying during that time. In 19 in 18, as many as 50 to 100 million people lost their lives. A similar virus today could kill many more. What started for millions around the globe as muscle aches and a fever ended days or even hours later with many victims bleeding from their eyes, ears, nostrils, and into their lungs. Homeless orphans, their parents dead, wandered the empty streets. 
One agonized official in the stricken east sent an urgent warning west. Hunt up your woodworkers and set them to making coffins. Then take your street laborers and set them to digging graves. This is a clipping from the New York Times at the time. Victims of plague everywhere. Great pyres of bodies consumed by the flame. Many victims strangled in their own bloody fluids. Their corpses, tinged blue from suffocation, were said to have been stacked like cordwood outside of morgues as cities ran out of coffins. So they dug mass graves. That 1918 flu virus killed more people in 25 weeks than AIDS has killed in 25 years. No war, no plague, no famine has ever killed so many in so short a time. Where did it come from? Well, the conventional wisdom is that the 1918 pandemic was triggered when an H1N1 bird virus, in its entirety, all eight gene segments, jumped into human beings. We then apparently passed it along to pigs, sickening millions of them as well. After the pandemic, once our human immune systems got used to the new virus, it turned into the regular seasonal flu, and in pigs it turned to what we call classic or classical swine flu. Before 1918, there aren't reports of pigs ever getting the flu at all. We have you know, reports going back centuries of horses, for example, getting the flu, but no veterinary reports of pigs ever getting the flu until 1918. So the swine flu may be less than 100 years old. So. Throughout the Roaring Twenties, people got the regular flu every year, and pigs got swine flu, same with the Thirties, and same with the Forties. Now, in uh, 1957, an H2N2 bird virus combined with the seasonal flu, swapping in three genes, triggering the relatively mild 1957 pandemic, and then uh, turned into seasonal flu. Nothing happened to swine flu, though, which remained completely stable. In 1968, an H3 bird virus combined with the seasonal flu, swapping in two genes, triggering the mild 1968 pandemic, and then turned into the seasonal flu that we've had ever since. Still nothing happened with swine flu, which continued to remain stable. Stable into the 1970s in North America, and stable through the 1980s. But uh, then, by 1999, Everything changed. A never-before-described triple species flu virus arose. Uh, the classic swine flu virus, after being stable for 80 years straight, picked up three gene segments from the circulating human flu virus and then two gene segments from a bird flu virus to create the first triple animal reassortment virus ever described. Our first discovered hybrid, a human pig viral mutant was discovered in an industrial pig production operation in Newton Grove, North Carolina in August of 1998, owned by a massive pork conglomerate called Hogslat. Within months of this discovery, our triple hybrid mutant had spread throughout the United States. Blood samples were taken from more than 4,000 pigs across 23 states just a few months later. In early 1999, more than half the pigs tested positive for exposure in Iowa, Oklahoma, Texas. Uh, 10 out of 10 herds positive in Illinois, 9 out of 10 in Kansas. Soon, it spread into Canada. And by 2003, the majority of animals tested in industrial pig operations in Mexico also showed evidence of exposure to our triple hybrid strain. We then exported it to Asia, and then the favor was apparently returned. After reshuffling with classic swine flu, our Made in the USA triple reassortment virus picked up two gene segments from a Eurasian swine flu line to create the flu pandemic of 2009. The primary progenitor, the main ancestor of our last pandemic flu virus, as shown in orange, is the triple hybrid mutant that emerged and spread throughout factory farms in the United States more than a decade ago. Six out of the eight gene segments, three quarters of the pandemic virus straight from our triple hybrid. And in this diagram, these data are taken from the most comprehensive genetic analysis done to date. 
Now, influenza experts have been warning about this triple hybrid mutant for years, calling it an extremely promiscuous mammalian adapted virus. Uh, flu scientists used to only worry about Southeast Asia, but given the appearance of the triple hybrid mutant, now you know, we need to look in our own backyard for where the next pandemic may appear, and six years after this publication, it did. So after eight decades of stability, what happened in the 1990s that contributed to these unprecedented changes in swine flu? And the same question with bird flu. Look, no human deaths from avian influenza for eight decades until 1999, excuse me, 1997, when H5N1 started killing people in Hong Kong. Then an H7N7 bird flu uh, emerged in the Netherlands, which went on to infect 1,000 people. Uh, and uh, ended up transmitting human to human. Uh, these are just two examples of the new bird flu viruses affecting people. In poultry, the uh, number of outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza in the first few years of this century has already exceeded the total number of outbreaks recorded for the entire 20th century. As one leading flu expert told Science, we've gone from a few snowflakes to an avalanche. What's been happening in recent years to trigger this kind of evolution and fast forward for both swine and chicken flu viruses? Well, one could ask the world's leading expert, Dr. Robert Webster, as did the senior correspondent of NewsHour with Jim Lair. Was there something qualitatively different about this last decade made it possible for this disease to do something it hadn't done before? Some kind of change in conditions that suddenly lit a match to the tinder? Webster replied. He says, farming practices have changed. Right? He talks about you know, growing up on a farm. Right? Uh, but now, we put millions of chickens into a chicken factory, next door to a pig factory. And this virus has the opportunity to get in one of these chicken factories and make billions and billions of these mutations continuously. And so what we've changed is the way we raise animals. What we've changed is the way we raise animals. And then he talks about how the virus is escaping from these factories, uh, infecting wild birds. Um, but that, he says, is what's changed. Um, uh, eight years ago, the world's three leading authorities got together for a joint consultation. The World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and the World Organization for Animal Health, the top kind of veterinary authority on the planet. Their job was to uncover the key underlying causes for these emerging animal-to-human diseases. Number one on their list of themes of risk factors was this increasing demand for animal protein the world over. Yeah, you know, animals were domesticated 10,000 years ago, but never before like this, uh, especially pigs and poultry. You know, chickens used to you know, peck around the barnyard. But now chickens raised for meat are typically warehoused in sheds confining tens of thousands of birds. Half of the egg-laying hens in the world are now intensively confined in so-called battery cages, small barren wire enclosures extending down long rows in often windowless sheds. There can be a million birds on one farm. About half the world's pig population is also now crowded into industrial confinement operations. You know, old McDonald's farm got replaced, one might say, by the new McDonald's farm. These intensive systems represent the most profound alteration of the human-animal relationship uh, in 10,000 years. No surprise, perhaps, that they've been shown repeatedly to be breeding grounds for disease. Uh, strep suis, Nipah virus, bovine spongiform cephalopathy, so called mad cows, these are fostering of antibiotic resistant pathogens all tied to these industrial systems. But what about influenza? The increasing numbers of flu viruses jumping from farm animals to people. The acceleration of human influenza problems in recent years. Well, uh, to review, here are all the new influenza viruses infecting humans over the last century or so, up to just 2005. Right? There was 1918, 1957, 1968, but then look at just kind of 1995 on, kind of snowflakes to an avalanche and people too. Uh, but why? Well, according to the world's leading agriculture authority, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, 
This is expected to largely relate to the intensification of poultry production and possibly pig production as well. The big shift in the ecology of avian influenza appears to be the industrialization of the global poultry sector. We're changing the way animals live by the billions, uh, spread wing to wing. The number of chickens slaughtered every day would wrap more than twice around the world's equator. In the early 1980s, nearly all the chickens in China were raised in tiny outdoor backyard flocks. Now, there are 63,000 CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations in China, with a few confining more than 10 million birds at a single operation. We cram tens of thousands of animals into cramped, filthy football field-sized sheds to lie beak to beak or snout to snout atop their own waist, arguably to a perfect storm environment for the emergence and spread of so-called super strains of influenza. This is how Dr. Webster envisions the emergence of the bird flu H5N1, uh, the deadliest flu virus ever recorded. First, its evolution in chickens from waterborne transmission to airborne transmission. All bird flu viruses seem to start out harmless to both birds and people. It's very important to understand. They start out harmless. In its natural state, the influenza virus has existed for millions of years as an innocuous intestinal, waterborne infection of aquatic birds like ducks. Then how does a duck's intestinal bug end up in a human cough? Well, in humans, the virus must make us sick in order to spread. It must make us cough in order to uh, transmit virus from one person to the next. In the virus's natural reservoir, though, the duck doesn't get sick because the virus doesn't necessarily need to make the duck sick to spread. In fact, one might say it's in the virus's kind of best evolutionary interest for the bird not to get sick so it can spread even farther. After all, the, the dead ducks don't fly very far. So, the virus silently multiplies in the duck's intestinal lining, is excreted into the pond water, and then is swallowed up by another duck, and the cycle continues, as it has for millions of years, and no one gets hurt. But if an infected duck is dragged to a live poultry market, for example, crammed into cages, allowing splattering of you know, virus-infected droppings on terrestrial birds, land-based birds like, like chickens, then the virus has a problem. Like a fish out of water, when the virus finds itself in the gut of a chicken at one of these you know, viral swap meets, it no longer has the luxury of easy waterborne spread. You know, chickens aren't paddling around in the pond, so the virus must mutate or die. Unfortunately for us, mutating is what influenza viruses seem to do best as RNA viruses. So in aquatic birds, the virus is perfectly adapted, harmless, but when thrown into a new environment, land-based birds like chickens, it quickly starts mutating to adapt to the new host. In the open air, the virus must resist dehydration, for example. It may have to spread to other organs to find a new way to travel. Uh, the intestines ain't going to work anymore for the virus, and it may find the lungs and become an airborne pathogen, which is bad news for terrestrial mammals such as ourselves. It goes into chickens as an aquatic virus, but may come out as the flu. Then H5N1's transformation from harmless to deadly, presumed to have happened in these factory farms, from a low pathogenicity virus, harmless, to a highly pathogenic strain of the flu. In a, in a new host, the more virulent, the virus becomes in this adaptation process, the quicker it may be able to overwhelm the immune system of its new host. But if it becomes too deadly, though, it may not spread as far. In an outdoor setting, at least, if the virus kills its host too quickly, the animal may be dead before it has a chance to infect too many others. So in nature, uh, there may be a limit to how virulent these viruses can get, or at least it was, until now. Enter industrial poultry production. When the next beak is just inches away, there may be no limit to how nasty the virus can get. Evolutionary biologists believe that this may be the key to the emergence of hypervirulent, so-called predator-like viruses like H5N1. Disease transmission from immobilized hosts. When you have a 
situation where the healthy cannot escape the disease, where the virus can knock you flat and still transmit from one to another just because you're so crowded, then there may be no stopping rapidly mutating viruses from becoming truly ferocious. And this may explain the virus of 1918 arising out of the trenches of World War I. There were crowded troop transports. Boxcars were labeled eight horses or 40 men. So apparently, when this harmless virus found itself in these kind of conditions, it turned deadly. Millions forced together in close quarters. Where there's no escaping a sick comrade. This is thought to be where the flu virus of 1918 may have gained its virulence. From the virus's point of view, these same trench warfare conditions exist today in every industrial chicken shed, in every industrial egg operation, every industrial turkey operation, for that matter, given the season. Intensively confined, crowded, stressed, but by the billions, not just millions. The industry is slowly waking up to this growing realization that you know, viruses previously innocuous to natural host species have in all probability become more virulent by passage through these large commercial populations. This is uh, from an international uh, industry trade journal. Starts out harmless, turns deadly. That's what these conditions may be able to do. This is not arguably how animals were meant to live. So how does the poultry industry feel about the possibility of its own so-called factory farms leading to a pandemic that could kill millions of people? Well. The executive editor of Poultry Magazine wrote an editorial on just that topic. The prospect of a virulent flu, to which we have absolutely no resistance, uh, is frightening. However, to me, the threat is much greater to the poultry industry. I'm not as worried about the U.S. human population dying from bird flu as I am that there will be no chicken to eat. If we don't count the externalized costs to society, Factory farming be a very efficient method of production. But no matter how cheap the meat, it may not be worth the risk. It may be no coincidence that our first hybrid swine flu was discovered in the state with the single densest pig population in the country, North Carolina. In fact, the virus was found in the county with the single highest pig population in the nation, now confining more than 2 million pigs. In the 1920s, there were fewer than 2 million pigs in the entire state. And into the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, classic swine flu continued to reign unchanged into the 80s. By 1989, the North Carolina pig population reached about 3 million, but then came the 90s. The year that our first discovered hybrid mutant was found in North Carolina was the year the pig population in the state hit 10 million. At the same time, the number of operations diminished fourfold, resulting in this dramatic intensification of the North Carolina pork industry, leading up to the emergence of the new hybrid flu virus first discovered there. What role might this intensification have played in the emergence and spread of these novel viruses? Well, there are at least you know, 10 reasons why industrial pork production may present such a breeding ground for disease. Let me uh, quickly run through them. The majority of U.S. pig factories now confine more than 5,000 animals each, 5,000 know, captive viral hosts. Uh, so it goes without saying that, you know, look, with a group of 5,000 animals, if a novel virus shows up, it'll have more opportunity to replicate, potentially spread, than in a group of, you know, 100 pigs on some small farm. Or more colorfully, um, uh, from, uh, from uh, Hopkins, um, instead of a virus only having one spin of the roulette wheel, it has thousands and thousands of spins at no extra cost. It, it drives the evolution of new diseases. Here's some data that kind of backs up the common sense. You know, this is an investigation of relationship between farm size and the risk of the Eurasian lineage uh, swine flu infection. They found that pigs from larger fa farms, you know, with a standing pig population greater than 5,000, appeared to have significantly higher risk for classic swine influenza H1N1 infection compared to pigs originating from smaller farms. 
The odds of H1N1 in pigs from those massive farms five times more as compared to the farms confining less than 1,000 pigs. Same result was found for another strain in the swine flu. Pigs from farms with thousands of animals were up to nine times more likely to have H3N2 swine inf flu influenza um, infection as compared to pigs from farms with you know, only hundreds of animals. A study of pig farms in North America similarly concluded that you know, increasing the number of finishers, uh, so-called fattening pigs, by 1,000 quadruples the odds of a herd being positive for swine flu. Four times the odds of infection for every additional 1,000 pigs you cram in, which again just makes a certain kind of sense. And when one crowds together the pig operations themselves in the U.S. Midwest and Southeast, the, the, the Dutch pig belt in Europe and China, infection risk is increased because of greater opportunities for windborne and other modes of virus transmission. Uh, one can apparently decrease herd infection risk 16-fold simply by not packing them all together so tightly. And now we're co-locating pig factories next to chicken factories, facilitating these cross-species drums, uh, jumps, a uh, practice Webster calls unsound. One scenario as to the emergence of the triple hybrid virus in 1998 is that it was you know, circulating for a few years before it mutated or simply obtained a critical density necessary to burst into the U.S. pig population. Swine flu is spread just like human flu through respiratory droplets and nasal secretion. So you know, overcrowding pigs allows for large infectious loads to transmit from one animal to another increasing the likelihood that extremely rare mutations can get passed on rather than just you know, dead ending in an individual. Um, and in my writings on the subject, um, you know, I review these, these so-called serial transmission experiments that show you don't tend to get the adaptation, the increase in virulence and transmission unless you use a large enough viral dose to allow for these rare mutants to be passed along. It's hard to imagine a better way to engineer a system to build up these kind of infectious loads than what we already have in some sectors of the pork industry today. And in terms of novel virus then spreading, not only may increased the number of pigs per geographic region facilitate airborne transmission, but an increase in the number of fattening pigs per pen has been associated with an, uh, higher risk of swine flu infection because this you know, simply allows more opportunities for direct nose-to-nose -nose contact or aerosol spread of the virus between, you know, pen mates. It's, it's like putting 5,000 people in an elevator and someone sneezes. You know, of course, the more you crowd them, the faster a respiratory virus is going to spread. If overcrowding pigs so tightly increases the risk of emergence and spread of new viruses, why does the industry do it? Because overcrowding pigs pays. According to the trade publication National Hog Farmer, you, know, you can maximize profits by dropping the space per pig to six square feet. Uh, that's a 200-pound pig in like you know, two feet by three feet. And now they acknowledge this presents some problems, inadequate ventilation, increased health risks, but you know, sometimes crowding pigs a little tighter will make you more money. Though it makes sense for the pork industry's bottom line, we're only beginning to understand the true cause of this approach, the externalized costs to society. Furthermore, a large number of pigs per pen also creates physiological stress, which in turn can alter the immune system and predispose pigs to infection, which brings us to the fourth factor. The operation in Newton Grove, North Carolina, where our first hybrid swine flu virus was found, was a breeding facility in which thousands of sows were confined in gestation crates, also known as sow stalls. These are you know, veal crate-like barren metal cages about two feet wide. These highly intelligent social animals basically kept in a box week after week, month after month, for nearly their entire lives. They can develop crippling joint deformities, lameness. Uh, if you did this to a dog, you get thrown in jail. Right? Not only can these pregnant pigs not turn around, they can barely move at all. The rise in stress hormone levels in created sounds is thought to be because of interference with the expression of natural maternal behaviors like nest building. 
and the frustration of normal maternal behavior may result in impaired immunity. As the Pew Commission on Industrial Formal and Production concluded, along with the Hopkins School of Public Health, the practices that restrict natural motion, such as sow gestation crates, induce high levels of stress in the animals and threaten their health, which in turn may threaten our health. Measures as simple as providing straw bedding may decrease morbidity and mortality compared to those you know, concrete slatted floors, presumably by eliminating the immunosuppressive stress of lying on bare concrete their whole lives, which may, may also lead to increased infection risk. This minimal act, providing straw, has been shown to decrease the risk of swine flu infection. And for anyone who's uh, German, maybe a bit rusty, uh, table two, risk factors significantly associated with influenza virus infection compared to straw bedding, bare slatted floors, two and a half times the infection risk. Yet we often deny them even this modicum of mercy to their detriment and potentially to ours as well. The National Livestock and Meat Board defends intensive confinement in a pamphlet called Facts from the Meat Board. Confinement rearing has its precedent. Schools are examples of confinement rearing of children. They know. Not that different from how they describe veal crates as similar to a baby's crib. The fact that the industry feels the need to mislead consumers by conjuring images of classrooms and baby cribs speaks to how far out of step animal agriculture has gone from mainstream values of just you know, basic decency towards animals, and they know it. As a professor emeritus of animal science uh, wrote in one of his college textbooks, you know, one of the best things modern animal agriculture has going for it is that most people haven't a clue how animals are raised. Uh, for modern animal agriculture, the less the consumer knows, the better. Ammonia released from decomposing waste may burn the pig's respiratory tracts, predispose them to respiratory infection in the first place. Ammonia levels have been significantly associated with both pneumonia and pleuritis, or, or lung lining inflammation. The dankness and uh, lack of direct sunlight enables the flu virus to survive much longer periods than it otherwise would be able to outside. The UV rays and sunlight are actually quite effective in destroying the influenza virus. 30 minutes of direct sun completely inactivates even H5N1, uh, the kind of the most environmentally stable flu virus yet it can last for days in the shade and weeks in moist manure, which brings us to factor seven. Millions of gallons of excrement spewed into open air cesspits. Swine flu viruses have been shown experimentally to multiply in a pig's digestive tract, be released into feces, and can survive in the slurry of urine and feces for weeks. The spread of this untreated, untreated waste on nearby land may then spread the virus out into the environment, to other herds, these huge tunnel ventilation fans may suck up aerosolized, aerosolized pathogens and have been able to have been shown to be able to blow large volumes of infectious particles out into the countryside, which I think really helps illustrate how loosely a term like biosecurity or biocontainment could ever really be applied to industrial animal agriculture. And all this manure attracts flies. Here's a picture taken outside of the home of a neighbor to one of these factory farms. And this level of fly infestation is more than just social and property value implications. Research on avian influenza suggests that contaminated flies may move the virus from one confinement operation to another, even you know, miles away. Pig factory employees can dip their boots in antiseptic foot baths all they want. You can't keep flies out of a hog cape boat. Just as the U.S. pork industry jeopardized the public through the mass feeding of clinically important antibiotics to pigs to help offset the effects of intensive confinement, the industry vaccinates its herds for swine flu. This doesn't prevent the disease, though. It just prevents the drop in carcass weight associated with infection that's so you know, bad for business. The so commercial vaccines that have been tested simply fail to reduce viral shedding, so swine flu viruses continue to circulate, continue to spread, and the immunological pressure placed on these viruses by the vaccines may select for viral mutants with different surface proteins. So it may select for swine flu viruses that grab human or avian genes, possibly increasing the risk of infection for animals and humans, 
by favoring genetic mutation and the generation of viral mutants. Unfortunately, one of the surface proteins or triple hybrid virus picked up from Eurasia was the M gene, which uh, codes for an ion channel, which normally we can plug up with the antiviral drug amantadine, but uh, in Eurasia, swine flu viruses have grown resistant to the drug, like many of the bird flu viruses spreading out of Asia. Why? Well, factory farms in China were feeding the drug to their chickens, putting it right into the water supply, uh, potentially you know, effectively eliminating half of our anti-flu classes of viral treatment drugs. And finally, long-distance live animal transport. The ancestral virus of the current pandemic was first found in August 1998. But then how did it spread across the entire country in a few months' time? And then the world, right? Mexico, Canada, even Asia. Right? Contaminated trucks and shipping containers have been blamed for the global spread of swine flu. In the United States, pigs are trucked coast to coast. Red meat travels an average of 1,000 miles, quote unquote, on the hoof before it reaches our plate. Pigs may be bred in North Carolina, but then fattened in the Corn Belt of Iowa and then slaughtered in California. Sometimes it's cheaper to you know, bring the pigs to the corn rather than the corn to the pigs. We used to have family farms, not factory farms. These 10 factors may explain why swine flu was stable, unchanging for 80 years before it mutated and ended up triggering the 2009 pandemic. Before factory farms, you know, there were you know, fewer animals, you know, less clouded, crowding on farms, you know, less crowding of the animals who are out, you know, actually able to you know, move around. Right? They were outside where you know, influenza viruses get dehydrated to death and breathe and zap by sunshine. Manure was composted and actually fertilized the earth rather than contaminating it, attracting swarms of flies. We didn't have to feed them drugs, and even if a new virus arose, where would it go? Right? The, the pigs end up in a local butcher shop, not halfway around the world. And that factor alone really confirms the link between industrial pork production and the current pandemic. And how else could a virus get to Minnesota, Mexico, and Malaysia? How else? The answer is well, when pigs fly. Last year, we got confirmation that indeed the dissemination of flu viruses in U.S. swine populations may indeed follow these long-distance swine movements, uh, which would explain the rapid spread of the triple reassortment virus that was to form the basis of the pandemic virus that uh, went on to affect a significant segment of the population, killing thousands. But look, only a few thousand have died, though, and the worst case scenario would be if, a, if the swine flu were to combine with the H5N1 bird flu, both of which have been found in pigs, right? So if a single pig in parts of Asia or Africa, you know, where swine flu is, excuse me, bird flu has become endemic, becomes co-infected with both the new swine flu and bird flu, the concerns that could theoretically produce a virus with the human transmissibility of swine flu, but also the human lethality of H5N1. In 1918, the mortality rate of the pandemic virus was less than 5%. Uh, this estimate on the right that I showed before is based on the same 2 to 3% mortality rate, uh, what the CDC calls a Category 5 pandemic, around 2% mortality, around 2 million Americans dead. So that's 2%. H5N1 so far, um, you know, has officially killed over half of its known human victims. You know, and you seem to get a coin toss as to whether or not you live through the disease. Um, Robert Webster, the so-called godfather of flu research. We go back to uh, 1918. 2.5% of people died. How many people are dying with bird flu? 50%. We've never seen such an event since the time of the plague. Up to 60 million Americans get the flu every year, and as many as a billion people worldwide. What if it suddenly turned deadly? That's what uh, keeps everyone up at night, the, the virologists up at night. The possibility, however slight, that a flu virus like H5N1 could trigger a human pandemic. That would be like combining one of the most contagious known diseases, influenza, with one of the deadliest, like cross 
passing a disease like Ebola with the common cold. What can we do to prevent this kind of thing in the first place? Well, to lower our risk of generating increasingly dangerous farmed animal flu viruses, the global meat and poult and egg industries must uh, you know, reverse course away from greater intensification by, for, for example, here in the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, and replacing large industrial units with you know, smaller farms with lower stocking densities, potentially resulting in you know, less stress, less disease susceptibility, less infectious contacts, and smaller infectious loads. The United Nations itself has urged the governments Local authorities, international agencies need to take a greatly increased role in combating the role of factory farming, which, combined with live animal markets, provides you know, ideal conditions for the flu virus to spread and mutate into a more dangerous form. Factory farms can be thought of as you know, incubators for the original emergence of dangerous strains of the flu. And then once a new virus emerges, CAFOs can act as amplifiers of influenza. As folks at the University of Iowa Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases suggested, a human influenza epidemic due to a new virus could be locally amplified by the presence of these confined animal feeding operations in the community. So no wonder the American Public Health Association, the largest and oldest association of public health professionals in the world, has called for a moratorium on factory farming. In 2007, the Journal of the APHA published an editorial that went beyond just calling for de-intensification of the pork and poultry industries. The editorial questioned the prudence of raising so many animals for food in the first place. It is curious that changing the way humans treat animals, most basically ceasing to eat them, or at the very least radically limiting the quantity of them that is eaten, it was largely off the radar as a significant preventive measure. Uh, such a change if sufficiently adopted or imposed, though, could still reduce the chances of the much feared influenza epidemic. It would even more likely to prevent future unknown diseases in the absence of this change that may result from farming animals intensively and killing them for food. Yet, look, humanity doesn't even consider this option. We don't tend to shore up the levees until after disaster strikes. The editorial concludes, look, for those who consume animals, look, they're not only harming the animals and endangering themselves, they could be threatening the well-being of future generations. Right, it's time for humans to remove their heads from the sand and recognize the risks to themselves that can arise from their maltreatment of other species. So how we treat animals can have global public health implications. So how has the industry responded? Let me just close with this. To these kinds of conclusions emanating from the scientific community. Well, a few summers ago, the United Nations released yet another report on the global health risks of industrial animal agriculture, along with the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Let me show you what kind of reception it got in the U.S. agribusiness. Feedstuffs is America's leading agribusiness publication. And editorial responded this way to the FAO research report. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations claims to use scientists to generate reports. But I wonder if those scientists don't resemble a bearded man living in a cave in Pakistan who wants the U.S. on its knees. I hope you'll agree that rather than sending out SEAL Team 6 to shoot the messenger, it would be more prudent to allow the public health community's concerns to inform agriculture policy. In response to the pandemic, the pork industry, instead of changing its practices, instead concentrated on changing the pandemic's name from editorial in nature. You know, unlike their colleagues in public health, who focus their energies on protecting the planet's, you know, seven billion humans, uh, animal health specialists, you know, their primary uh, mission tends to be to promote and protect the national and national livestock and meat trade. And this focus on commerce can lead to conflicts of interest as well as policy positions that border on denial. But this year was a turning point. McDonald's vowed to eliminate gestation crates from their supply chain, uh, effectively signaling an end to the widespread use of this practice. Finally, we're starting to see steps in the right direction. In this age of emerging diseases, there are now billions of feathered and curly-tailed test tubes for viruses to incubate and mutate within billions more spins at pandemic roulette. But along with human culpability, though, comes hope. Uh, if changes in human behavior can cause new plagues, well, then changes in human behavior may prevent them in the future. Due to uh, 
time constraints, this uh, presentation was by design, a real oversimplification, a very serious public health issue for the underlying science. Allow me to refer, refer you to my invited paper I wrote for Critical Reviews of Microbiology. I'd be happy to send anybody a PDF reprint. Just email me, mhg1 at cornell.edu. And uh, my book, uh, Bird Flu, is now available online free at birdflubook.org. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the webinar. would love to take some questions. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Greger. Um, I had a couple of questions that had come in privately. Um, would the elimination of factory farms and gestation crates bring us back from this pandemic cliff, or is the genie out of the bottle? Well, um, for um, H5N1, the genie is out. But look, the genie's been out for a while. The genie came out in 1997. We were able to actually beat it out. And the way we did that was um, um, basically destroying every chicken in Hong Kong. Um, and so we just kind of raised the ground. Um, and look, the virus went away. Um, uh, I mean, if we did that again, but basically had one big you know, worldwide barbecue and just didn't set any more chickens in the, in the sheds, I mean, every 45 days, essentially, you know, the entire world's poultry population gets you know, rehatched. And if, and if we, we kind of cut that cycle, um, uh, presumably we'd have uh, the same effect we had back in 1997, stopping uh, the virus in Hong Kong. But uh, obviously, uh, that's unlikely to happen. Um, and so H5N1 is out. But again, look, it's been out since 1997. Um, even though the human lethality is uh, approaching 60% uh, in terms of case mortality, um, only a few hundred people have been infected. Right? It's been around literally a decade. Well, I mean, over a decade now. Um, and the still um, has just uh, infected hundreds of people. Maybe there's something biologically unique about H5N1 that won't allow it to, you know, gain the easy transmissibility from person to person. Well, we certainly better hope so. But you know, every year that goes by and it doesn't um, trigger a human pandemic, you know, makes us feel well. You know, makes us at least in our optimistic moments think, well, maybe this virus isn't going to do it. So what these changes? in, um, in uh, industrial animal agriculture can do is prevent the next H5N1 um, or the next you know, H1N1, um, uh, the next of some of these uh, hybrid viruses. Or, you know, very, or if it can't prevent their emergence, at least it can prevent their spread. Um, so if we move, for example, to a carcass-only trade um, that you, know, you can't transport live animals with a few exceptions, um, but uh, in general can only um, uh, you know, transport the meat, that would go a long way. Um, to um, you know, d diminishing this rapid worldwide spread of any new virus that kind of pops up um, in industrialized animal agriculture. So, um, uh, but look, it's it's never too late to start, um, and uh, obviously doing nothing, um, given the last few decades, would not be a good course to go down. Wonderful, thank you. I have uh, not a question, but a statement that this is an excellent presentation and would love to see this speaker again. So I feel the same way. Hopefully we will ask you back again. I do have another question, and it sort of relates to what you were just talking about. Um, does any of the work being done in genomics offer um, some hope either to uh, stop the transmission of current viruses or to um, mitigate the mutation? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, there are currently scientists, and they have been for many years, trying to genetically engineer a chicken that is immune to uh, influenza virus infection. Um, similar attempts have been made in the past, for example, to genetically modify cattle um, to not fall prey to mad cow disease. Uh, but you know, kind of a, I see in a similar situation. Look, instead of tinkering with the you know DNA of this species, you know, how about just stopping the feeding of slaughterhouse waste, blood, and manure to farm animals, right? I mean, that, the mad cow disease came out because we, um, you know, the industry tried to save on feed costs, and so they were feeding everything from concrete dust to newspaper to anything to decrease feed costs, and by you know turning cows not in, only into kind of meat eaters but cannibals as well, led to um, led to uh, to this new human um, uh, invariably fatal dementia. 
Um, and so, but what's the industry's, you know, answer? Uh, instead of stopping this obviously unnatural um, practice, look, the practice saved money, so let's genetically engineer a cow. So instead of changing the cow's environment, right, let's change the cow. It's like when you take uh, egg-laying hens and you put them and you pack them into little cages, so each one has less than a you know single pa piece of paper of living space to live their entire lives in. You know they start pecking each other, um, uh, you know because they can't express their normal pecking order. Um, and so what's the answer? The industry doesn't change their environment because the environment is profitable. They change the hens and they 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 burn off or cut off the ends of their beaks. So they can still peck at each other, but they won't do the damage. And so you can still, um, you know, at least they won't kill each other, so you can still get the egg. And one sees that kind of over and over um, in, the, in the pork industry. Um, uh, the, when you pack animals in like this, they may bite each other's tails. What do you do? Do you give them a little more breathing room? Let them run around a little bit? No, you cut off their tails. And they just sniff off the tails, um, um, you know, at birth. So again, it's like, look, do we change? the animal or do we change the environment of the animal that we've kind of unnaturally put them in and I think in general it would make more sense to um, to change the this unnatural environment that we place them in. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, one other question. Are there viruses, um, you've, you've mentioned the bovine spongiform, spongiform encephalopathy um, and what that did to the um, cow population and, and uh, some human beings as well. Are there viruses that are living in other either avian or um, mammalian uh, species that haven't broken through that barrier and become um, likely pandemic instigators yet, but that we need to be aware of? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and there is now an entire science, this kind of One Health movement among veterinarians and clinicians, public health advocates, um, to, to um, you know, we're all kind of so subspecialized, and we now need to realize that some of these animal pathogens can be so-called zoonotic pathogens, can transmit um, from animal populations into human populations, particularly when there's these kind of disruptions in environments. So, for example, when we uh, cut down habitat, all of a sudden we're, we're kind of, um, we come into contact with pathogens that we normally may not have come into contact. Or we build logging roads into, into deep jungle and allows, um, you know, viruses, uh, you know, uh, that viruses like HIV, for example, to, you know, not just infect a few people in the village, but actually spread around the world. Um, and so, you know, since every virus um, uh, you know, both discovered and, un and undiscovered can basically be on anyone's doorstep in a 24-hour time, given our kind of global interconnectedness now, we really do have to take kind of an inventory on what is out there. Um, and so there are teams, for example, in Central Africa um, taking, you know, blood samples from, uh, from uh, you know, the folks that have, um, that participate in the bushmeat trade, for example, and kill uh, our fellow primates. Um, for food, which is how we think that the emergence of HIV happened. Someone butchered a chimpanzee, and a few decades later, we have 25 million people dead. And so we're we're looking for similar, um, uh, you know, retroviruses. Um, uh, and there's all sorts of uh, of possibilities um, that again just may not, you know, maybe a few mutations away. Um, there's a number of bugs we really need to keep an eye out for. Um, so, for example, you know, we got lucky with SARS in that the symptoms appeared. Um, kind of before, you know, uh, the, the, the disease became symptomatic um, as it became transmissible. So you could set up, you know, temperature sensors, you keep people on, um, from getting on planes. Unfortunately, something like influenza, you can't stop that way. You can't quarantine it because you're perfectly healthy, but transmitting virus before you start showing symptoms uh, during the incubation period. But look, because we know of SARS, we need to stop the live animal, um, these live animal markets, these so-called wet markets. Um, we need to stop the trade in, uh, in cockfighting in Southeast Asia, which is a way some of these bird flu viruses get spread around. You know, how did we get monkeypox in, in the Midwest? Um, the way we got monkeypox is through the exotic pet trade, um, where they were bringing these, uh, these, uh, these uh, rodent species here in the U.S., and they mixed with some prairie dogs, and all of a sudden we have monkeypox, which is you know, something that normally would only affect um, people in uh, in certain parts of Africa. 
And so, again, the way we treat animals can have these global public health implications. And so it's kind of too late. Um, you know, by the time the new virus arises, like, you know, when SARS arises, okay, well, look, it can, you know, kill a thousand people before we kind of figure it out. Um, and so we really need to kind of take this precautionary principle, look at our recent history and say, look, we really need to put an end to some of these risky practices. How we treat animals can have global pu public health implications and let's stop them before um, the next problem arises. If I had to pick, you know, one or two uh, really concerning things on the horizon, well, everyone's always concerned about um, uh, multi-drug resistant plague. There's the plague bacteria, the plague, but like the bubonic plague bacteria. And the reason you, people don't die of the plague or a third of, you know, countries don't die of the plague anymore is because it's a bacteria. And for bacteria, we have effective antibiotics. But what if we had, uh, you know, uh, Yersinia pestis, this, the, the, the plague bacteria, um, which has been gaining um, uh, uh, antibiotic resistance, thanks, we think, to the use of mass use of antibiotics in aquaculture, in farmed, in fish farming operations, um, seem to have uh, led to the spread of these, these new uh, kind of uh, bacterial genes against, uh, with resistance to these important human clinical antibiotics. Um, you know, that's, that, that, that would be bad if we had a plague bacteria that was resistant to our antibiotics and then all of a sudden we're back in the Middle Ages. Um, and so how important is it to have, you know, uh, you know farmed fish and how, you know, what, what, what's kind of the, the public health implications of having cheap fish? Well, I mean, these are things that we really have to think of now that we realize um, the potential for these kind of pathogens to do damage. And one last question as we wrap up. Um, one of our participants has asked about the studies showing re uh, amazing replication of bird flu in crocodiles and asking if you have a comment and asking if it's something that would help the disease prevail. I have no idea. Thank you so much for that questioner. Um, um, uh, the flu virus is actually limited, relatively limited um, in terms of various species. It certainly it, it affects aquatic mammals uh, such as seals and whales. It, it affects horses. Only recently we discovered it can affect um, um, uh, dogs. Um, uh, but you know it affects some lab animals and some not. So ferrets being the, the traditional lab model for um, influenza, it's been, so these are some of the limitations the scientists have had in studying these diseases, and this is the first I've heard of a non-mammalian species coming down with influenza, and that would be a concern um, because the greater the host, um, the, the number of host species, the harder it would be to kind of keep a cap on it. So for example, the reason we were able to eliminate smallpox from the planet Earth, um, for all intents and purposes in the 1970s, was because it had one host, humans. And so we, we immunize humans, and the, the smallpox has nowhere to go. Um, uh, but something like influenza, unfortunately, we can't get rid of because it's naturally um, found in these uh, shorebirds and aquatic birds. Um, but what we can do is we can kind of get rid of these stepping stones um, that takes this innocuous virus and turns it into something uh, deadly for, for mammals by uh, you know rethinking our mass consumption of tens of billions of terrestrial birds um, every year, if we instead raised tens of billions of rabbits every year, we would not have these kind of influenza problems because you know rabbits don't get influenza. We could get maybe get some tularemia or some of these rabbit diseases, but uh, you know well, we just kind of we happen to pick the two species to make a billion of on this planet. Uh, pigs and uh, and uh, chickens um, that seem to be able to uh, be this kind of pandemic pandemic stepping stone to humans, um, and uh, but I had not heard about the alligators, but it's always bad news when um, more host species carry a pathogen. And the uh, questioner has put in the comment field that Dr. Elliot Jacobson or Jacobson of the University of Florida is someone you might want to talk with. Apparently, he has done that research. Thank We've you so much. Check it out. We have come to the end of our webinar. I want to thank you, Dr. Greger, and thank everyone who joined us for this very sobering and informative web webinar. Uh, we'll be posting the webinar so you can revisit it, and you can also invite others to share it. Um, 
I think it's something that everyone needs to see. We'll be sending out the link to the recording in the next day or so, as well as information about our other upcoming webinars. Um, we appreciate you joining us today and hope to see you again very soon. And have a safe and joyful Thanksgiving, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Greger. Thank you.